Happy Sunday morning. Hi, Pastor Joe and Mayor. How you guys doing? We promise we won't tear the place down. It'll be here when you get back. Maybe. So shame is a prison. School out the way. Shame is a robber. Call to take my name. Love is my redeemer. If you fear from the ground. So you can get up on your feet right now. We're going 
go see if you walked out of the gray on walking too. Let's get some audience participation going. It don't matter where you're at. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. out there I can't see you in TV land I don't have Facebook so I don't know how, how it works but I sat by my wife once and watched it and little hearts and stuff were flying so heart the heck out of this service today right um, thank you God yes Lord <laughs> yes Lord thank you God you are faithful yes Lord. we have a faithful God man We saying ain't no grave because there ain't no COVID. There ain't no nothing that can hold this body down. There's nothing. So we come here and we gather in your name to try and minister at your feet. And I'm still trying to figure that out because you are almighty God. And I'm a little piece of dirt that you made live for a little tiny bit. But we long for the day when we're face to face with you, Lord. When we see you face to face. But for now, we just say whatever we do, whatever we say here, we pray that it would be honoring and pleasing to you. But we ask... We always ask, God, sorry we're so needy, but in the midst of us ministering to you, that you would just do what you do. You'd pour out your spirit on us, Lord, that you would touch our, our physical bodies and heal us, that you would help our finances, that you would help our anxiety, that all the things that are coming against us right now, that you would encourage the body of Christ today to put on our armor and to stand. And having done all these things, we say stand. We love you, Lord, and worship you. Losing, sorry. <laughs> Before your mercy seat, oh, I can see lightning, I can feel thunder, I can hear the voices 
the seating of your throne. Said I can see the lightning, I can feel the thunder, I can hear the voices proceeding from your throne. There's 24 elders bowing down, they're casting down their crowns of gold. to 
first read the Bible the first time through Psalm 139 it jumped out at me it was a it was God saying man there's nowhere you can go there's no place you can go from my presence and I realized even when I was out in the mess of my life he was there with me God we need you right now Lord we need you now Restoration. You bring restoration. 
restoration to my soul. I think that's all that matters right there. You bring restoration. You bring restoration. Restoration to my soul, taking my name. You call me by a new name. You taking my shame in its place.
started reading the Bible was Psalm 23. It said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yes, God. He leads me into the green pastures and beside still waters. And this is the part that captivated me. He restores my soul. Yes, Lord. That's where we're at right now, Lord. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We're in the middle of it. You said in this world we'd have tribulation, but God, we're calling on you to be of, help us to be of good cheer right now because this world is gone crazy, Lord, and we're just calling out for the power of the Holy Spirit of God to not only comfort us but to anoint us and empower us to go out and do the work that you have laid before us anyways, the kingdom work that you so desperately are urging us to do, that we would go forth. People are dying and going to hell, and they'll continue to do that. If the body of Christ just sits by and watches, don't sit in your chair thinking, man, I got this, man, I got this. I'm good. I got my little chair. I'm working out my own salvation. End of my day yesterday, find out another beautiful young man that was in our program. He's no longer with us. You don't know the day or the hour. God, I pray for our soul that you would just yes, encourage Lord. us today. Silent before you and all of the wonders of your love. 
Good morning, church. Good morning, New Life Fellowship on Facebook Live, if you're watching right now. Good morning to you if you're watching it later on YouTube or the website. Um, have a few brief announcements for you guys this morning, and then we're going to get started. Um, could I get lights? So, as you guys know, we are still trying to stay connected, even though there is a lot of craziness going on and we are not able to come together as we normally have, we are still trying to stay connected. So for that, we need your guys' info. We need through Facebook. You can message it on the Facebook Messenger app. I have no idea how that works, but my wife does, so she tells me we're good. Um, you can get on the website. You know we have a website. Ronnie, I know, has said it at least once www.newlifebarstow.com. That is a website. That is the interweb address. Yes, I said that. Interweb address. www.newlifebarstow.com. You can get on there, click on the I'm New tab, and you can fill in all of your contact information so that we can find you and get a hold of you and send you emails and all kinds of cool stuff. You can call the church office. You can pick up the phone and call 760-256-6076. You can email the office at office at newlifebarstow.com. So you can send an email if you've got questions about what's going on and, and where, and we will get back to you there. The church office is remaining open. If you have questions, you can reach us at 760-256-6076. Um, and you can talk to somebody in the office. We're reaching out to everyone that we have contact info for. So this is why we're asking for your info. Because if we don't have your info, we're not going to be able to reach out to you. And we want to. We want to stay connected. That's something that we are very, very adamant about doing. So please give us your info so that we can reach out to you. Okay. Um, Facebook, New Life Fellowship. Barstow Foursquare Church. Get on there. If you're on there right now, which evidently if you're watching me, you are, make sure you like us on face page, on Facebook. Face page, yeah. Like us, please, on our Facebook page. There you go. I told you, I have no idea how Facebook works. Um, anyways, get on the Facebook app. Get on to the New Life 
Fellowship Barstow Foursquare Church page and like us. Share us so that others can find us and, and find out what great people we are. Okay, um, uh, giving. Let's talk about giving. Giving is still happening. Um, there's still many ways that you can give, tithes and offerings. So one of the best ways is, again, at that interweb address, www.newlifebarstow.com. If you get on there, after you've clicked on the I'm new and filled out all your info, you can click on the Give tab. And there are several options there that you can click on. It's real easy. I've done it myself. You can get on there. It, it takes no time. So get on there and do that. You can also do PayPal. Um, if you're going to do PayPal on the website, it's there. Just click on that link. You can also just drop it off at the office if need be. So there you go. During the week, 134 West Main Street. Or you can mail it. Yes, as Ron says, snail mail still exists. You can fill out an envelope, put a stamp on it, address it to New Life Fellowship, P.O. Box 519, Barstow, CA, 92312, and mail it. Okay, so again, the website, www.newlifebarstow.com. You can scroll to the bottom of our homepage. You'll be able to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. So if you're not able to watch this on Facebook Live, these do get posted to the YouTube channel, and you can watch them over and over again. I've watched a couple of them. It's really, really cool. All right. So I know that uh, there's been a lot of things that have changed, and I know I'm, I'm probably making an understatement here, but I just want to be, be one that reminds us all that the one thing that never changes, that is always constant, is Jesus, ever, ever constant, ever faithful, and so while many things have changed, he is not. He is the same today and yesterday and forever. So that being said, some of the things that have changed is obviously we are not having an in-person uh, Sunday service. I am standing here in the facility and it is very, very, very vacant with the exception of the worship team and myself. Um, however, you guys are there. Jesus is still in heaven. God is still on the throne. And we are still going to proclaim him. Amen? So that being said, Sunday mornings, 10 a.m., we are on Facebook Live. If you can't tune in, Facebook Live, again, you can watch us on YouTube. Wednesday nights, 7.30, we are doing a version of in person, outside, in the parking lot, socially distanced, with water and chairs. Please, please bring lots of water and a chair, because the, the asphalt outside is not comfortable to sit on once it is warmed up to 120 degrees. So we are coming together 7.30, Wednesday nights. We're having worship. We're praising God. We're doing what we're called to do as a body. Wednesday youth is online. They're having U-turn online, 7, to 7 p.m., New Life U-turn. So there you go. That's the things that have changed the Lord is still the same. Um, I want to pray real quickly over the offering just because I feel that we, uh, we need to continue to do the things that we know we should. So let's pray. Father God, I just pray right now over the offering, over all of those who, who are in need of work, Lord God, who are in need of income. Lord, you are the provider. Lord, many things have changed in this crazy world right now, Lord, but you are the same, and you are still faithful, God. Never have you ever failed me. Never will you. So we lift up these tithes and these offerings to you, Lord God. We lift up those that are standing in, in faith, Lord, and just we pray, Lord, that you would constantly pour out on us, Lord, the things that we are needing. Your spirit, your wisdom, your mercy, your grace, your love, Lord. I lift up all of those that are watching right now and that will be watching later, Lord God, that you would touch them, that you would continue to give them as needed, Lord, everything that you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we'll do a scene change. We used to do that when I was in drama, like you're, now I'm a new character, right? So I was Greg the announcer, and now I am, uh, I'm Greg the message giver today as well. So... Um, if you're wondering why I'm here and you're getting a face full of Greg, is because our pastors are on a much-deserved, well-earned vacation. 
um, they're spending some time with family, and so I was asked if I could if I could give a message today, and I said, sure, I would love to. Um, if you have your Bibles, or if you have your Bible app, I would ask that you please turn to Matthew 22, uh, verses, we're going to be in verses 37 and 38 to start with. And uh, while you're getting there, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and, and start reading this, this passage. It says in verse 37, it says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, this morning we come and we open the word and we just pray that, Lord, we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive the things that you have for us. I pray for everyone, Lord, that is watching this right now or will be watching it later, Lord, that that they would hear your heart, Lord, that they would be moved to, to the things that you've called us to. In Jesus' name. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, let me first of all say, hello, neighbor. For many of us, it's been far too long since I've seen a lot of you. And that's because of the wild circumstances that we find ourselves in and the busy schedules and things like that. But I just wanted to say, hello, neighbor. A short time ago, my wife and I sat down, and we had the opportunity to watch a movie called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Now, it is a story based on real events concerning Mr. Rogers and his interactions with a journalist. I don't want to give the whole movie away, but there will be some spoilers if you have not seen this yet. In brief, this journalist, who has a reputation of being hard-boiled, no-nonsense, very expose style, is given by his editor a fluff piece, as he calls it. He's told that he has to do a profile on one Mr. Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers. And it's for an upcoming series that the magazine that he works for will be running entitled Heroes. Now, as you watch through the movie, you'll find out rather quickly this man has issues. Raise your hand if you don't. We all have issues. This man has issues, and it becomes rather qu quickly apparent what some of his are. And the fact that the reason why he's such the journalist that he is is because he's a bit of a cynical person. So he decides that there's got to be more to the story than this thing that he's seen. And he's going to prove and, and show the world who the real Mr. Rogers is. So there's the... The gist of the, of the story. You guys get the background. Now, I'm sure that many of you, young and old alike, like myself, have some fond memories of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Either you were watching it when it was aired originally in its, you know, broadcast time slot, or, or you were watching it at reruns by the multiple networks and channels that have picked it up and have continued to run it even now. It seems everyone knows who Mr. Rogers is. So as Terry and I watched this movie, I found myself intrigued by the man Fred Rogers. Because when I was young and a kid, I was watching the show, it was always Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And he's bigger than life. And, you know, I remember the, one of the things that always kind of attracted me to his show was the methodical way he would come in and every time, and he would sit down and he would undo his shoes and he would take one off, and he's talking to you the whole time he's doing it, and then he would swap it out for another shoe. And the whole time, he never stopped talking to me while he was doing these things, ever. So Mr. Rogers, to me, was this bigger-than-life persona what I grew up with, and I'm sure many of you did as well. So watching this movie and seeing the story develop, and you, you get a chance to see Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. And the man intrigued me. The way they portrayed him in the story and some of the things that I'll, I'll share with you a little bit later, he really intrigued me. And so there's this scene in the movie where Mr. Rogers and this journalist are on a subway and they're traveling and they're having a conversation and from the middle of the car, this young lady cries out, hey, Mr. Rogers. And as he looks up, she begins to sing, 
It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, right? We all know the words. I will not sing any further because, well, we know why. But by the time she reaches the end of the song, everyone on this crowded subway train, including Mr. Rogers, has joined in. And they're singing it. And he's sitting there, and you can see in his face this just this overwhelming. And as they wrap it up, he's applauding them. And he tells them, that was wonderful. At that moment in the story, I realized something about the man, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. He never knew a stranger. Everyone was his neighbor. He invited them to be in person as well as on the show. And he genuinely loved them. Now, that last statement might seem a little bold for me to make. However, I believe that I can make it with great confidence because, as I said, I was intrigued by this story of him. And so I did a little bit of research about him, and I found out a couple of interesting things about Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, that I didn't know before I saw this movie. Maybe you didn't either. One of the which is the fact that Fred Rogers was a minister. He graduated from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and became a Presbyterian minister in 1962. I didn't realize that about them the whole time I was growing up and watching him on TV. Although now that I reflect, because I've come to know the Lord and I've seen the things that he's always talked about, it's like, duh, for me, it was a, well, of course he knew the Lord. Look at what he's talking about. Look at how he's interacting with people. Look at the message that he kept trying to put out there. So one of the things that I realized is that Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, absolutely understood the scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Because in his personal life and in his TV show, there was no difference for him. He loved as himself. So watching the movie and a couple of documentaries with him and some interviews with Fred, Mr. Rogers, it made me ask myself a few questions. And I'm going to share those with you today. And uh, I'll allow you to answer them for yourself. I'll share with you some of my answers. The first question I asked is, well, who is my neighbor? Are my neighbors only the people that live in the two houses on either side of me? Are they the people that I work with? Are they considered my neighbors? Or what about the people that I see at my shop or in the grocery store or walking down the street? Are they my neighbors? Well, consequently, Scripture records an instance where someone asked Jesus the same question. Jesus then told the parable of the Good Samaritan and how he treated someone who had been robbed. Now, those of you who remember the story of the Good Samaritan, there was a man who had went and he had been robbed. He would had everything taken from him, his clothes, his money, everything, and he had been beaten severely. And there were others who had come along, and rather than seeing if the man was okay or if he needed any assistance or if he was even alive, most of them just stepped around him, and continued on their way. And if you read the scripture for yourself, you'll see that a couple of them were prominent, and a couple of them should have had more compassion, maybe, than they did. But the important part of this story here is the third one, the Samaritan, who came along, found this person in need, bundled him up, carried him to a place where he could be re receiving the, need that he, the care that he needed, tended to his wounds, made provision for him to be able to stay, and told the innkeeper, whatever the bill is, when I come back, let me know I've got it. 
Didn't even know the man. Didn't even stay around to find out how the story ends. So Jesus tells this question here, this parable. And he ends it with this in Luke 10, 36 and 37. He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? 37 says, well, the expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So the answer to the question is, yeah, the two people that live on either side of me, they're my neighbors. And the people I work with, they're my neighbors. And the people that are coming to my shop, they're my neighbors. And just about anybody that I have any contact with at any given time in the kingdom of God are considered my neighbors. Hello, neighbor. Okay, so there's that question. What about, because <laughs> I'm that guy, right? I always ask God, well, yeah, but what about this, God? What about my enemies? Because you know what, Lord? I know some people that I wouldn't have them for neighbors if I had to. Well, interestingly enough, again, I'll go back to the words of Jesus. Matthew 5, 43 you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. I'll go ahead and read the rest. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so as I was reflecting on that and getting answers to the questions I shouldn't be asking, it dawned on me that the fact of the matter is, is there was a time when I was God's enemy and he still saw me as his neighbor and he still loved me. So even my enemies are my neighbors. Okay. But God, why can't I just love you and kind of just tolerate everyone else? I have no doubt that my wife is sitting there laughing at me right now because she has known me for a long time, and that has always been my, I'm kind of this, you know, I have a friend of mine who's sitting here this morning, and him and I have joked about the fact that, you know, I saw a t-shirt the other day that I wanted to get him. It's it's, it's got this porcupine standing there, and he's holding a sign that says, free hugs. (laughs) There you go. So God, why can't I just love you and tolerate others? Again, <laughs> Jesus makes it pretty clear. Matthew twenty two thirty seven and 38 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we need to remember that Jesus said these words in response to a question that was asked of him. Matthew 22 and 36, somebody had come to try and maybe trip Jesus up a little bit. And in 36, he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law, in the law? To which Jesus responded. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. These commandments are a package deal. You see for Jesus there was no separating this one from that one. And so. It's always interesting to me that I've noticed in my own life. And I'm sure many of you as believers have noticed this as well. The Lord always gives me more than I ask for. I've never, ever asked the Lord for something and got just barely enough, ever. 
every time I've asked the Lord for something in faith and in prayer and genuinely seeking with, with a heart that's in line with Him, I get over an abundant of what I, I've asked. And so here this, this person is trying to trip up Jesus and trying to get Him to say, well, pick this one. And Jesus says, no, no, as always, let me give you the whole Now, the commandments are a package deal. You can't have one without the other. You have to love God, and you have to love Jesus. Or, I'm sorry, neighbors as yourself. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 puts it this way. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Well, fine. All right. So I asked these questions, and I got my answers. And so I'm challenging you to ask the same questions that you may have. And then I want you to look at what does a neighbor, what does being a neighbor look like? To begin with, you have to examine your own heart. And I'm not talking about the real quick, hey, I'm good, everything's good. No worries here. No, no. I'm talking about the three in the morning when nobody else is awake and it's just you and the Lord and the Holy Spirit is moving you through the things in your heart that you need to give to Him, that you need to bring to Him, that you need to offer to Him. Those are the areas in your heart that you need to examine. And the reason why I'm making such a precise example is because that's where I was at. Three in the morning... I don't know about you, but I sleep pretty well, except, except when the Lord wants to talk to me. And I remember not too long ago, I was sleeping. I'd had a long day, and I'd worked, and then I'd been to my shop, and I was, you know. And I remember opening my eyes 3 a.m. Like, like I had just slept a perfect eight hours. And it's quiet in the house, and all I can hear is this voice that says, come here. And so I sat up, and I just began to pray. And the Lord began to share with me things in my heart that I needed to bring to Him. Examine your heart. And this is the reason why it's so important. We need to be accepting the love that God is giving us freely. How can you love others if you haven't learned to love yourself the way God has loved you? And there are many of us that have not gotten to that point yet. Yeah, we kind of get the idea that God loves us. Yeah, I know, God loves you. It's kind of like when you were a kid, you're trying to get out the house, and your mom's trying to tell you, hey, hey, I love you. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. You know, but you, you know, at that moment, you need to examine your heart. You need to learn to to love yourself the way that, that God loves you. Because the commandment's clear. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So talk about that for a moment. Let's see. I love myself, so I make sure I'm clothed. I make sure I'm fed. I make sure that if I'm sick, I get the medicine I need. I make sure that I, you know, keep myself in in a healthy condition, and, and I do those things because I love myself. And not this, you know, sickly, overwhelming, you know, self love, but just love of self. So if I love myself, how can I look at my neighbor and not love them the same way? But if I've never come to a point where I love myself because I've never fully accepted the love of God, then it's going to be really hard for me to look at my neighbor and see them in needing of love. I want you to hear me right now. If you're, if you're on Facebook Live and you're listening to me right now, or if you're watching me, you know, six hours, six weeks, six, six months from now. Hear this and know it, accept it, receive it. God loves you right now, right where you are. No matter what it is that you're in the middle of, God loves you. He loves you just as you are. Whatever it is that you think that you can't bring to him, bring it to him. 
because he loves you. He loves you deeper than any love you could ever imagine. He loves you beyond anything that you have ever done wrong. Hear my voice. If you hear nothing else, if you get nothing else out of this this message this morning, get that God loves you. It's vital. It's important. It's paramount to you accepting that he loves you so that you can be complete and you can share the love of God with others. And that's what it's about. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love others until you accept the love of God for yourself. You can't love God until you accept the love that God's given you. Scripture says in 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. And I've read through that scripture a bunch of times, and I've, I've kind of heard it. And when I was preparing for this message, I, were actually, I, I remember I actually sat and I just, I just meditated just on that. On the moment in my life and in my salvation and in my walk when I fully realized the love that God had for me. And I want to tell you, it's, it'll wipe you out. I was a counselor at a youth camp in Oklahoma. I've been saved for a while, and my wife and I had been serving in, in youth ministry. And so we go to summer camp with our kids. And we're having a great, great time. And it's the evening worship service, and we're up front, and some of the kids had gone up from our youth group, and, and they're at the altar. And I go up, and I'm going up with the intention I'm going to lay hands on them, and I'm going to pray. And I got up there, and I laid my hands on one of the young ladies that was in our youth group, and my wife was on the other side. And as soon as I touched her, I felt this overwhelming sense of how much God loved me. And I fell to my knees, and I curled up in a ball, and I cried my eyes out. And I spent time at his feet just basking in how much he loved me. Never, ever have I ever doubted his love for me from that moment on. Not one time. You have to accept his love for you. You have to understand what it is. You have to allow it like the song we sang earlier, his overwhelming love It is, I promise you, it is overwhelming. It is more than you can bear. You cannot stand under the great weight of the love that God has for you. And once you accept that and you receive it, then you can love others. Then you can love others the way that God loves you. It's vital. When you accept the love of God for you, You can forgive all that has ever been trespassed trespassed against you. Trust me in this. I could not forgive the people in my life that had done what I had felt was so grievous wrongs against me until I realized how much God loved me. And knowing where I was when he said that he loved me and when I, when I called upon his name and knowing how much he had forgiven me and coming to the realization of just how much he loved me, how could I not forgive those that had done me wrong? That's when I truly started to understand what it meant to love others as myself. And you need to as well. It's important for us as a church to become neighbors. And I'm not talking about the person you live, live next to. I'm talking about neighbors. Being the love in your neighborhood. Being the love at your job. Being the love in your community. Or in the store. Or in the gas line. Or in that debate that somebody's having because they're just so angry and they don't know how to express themselves. Be that neighbor. I believe there's no coincidence here 
no coincidence that during these times that are so trying for us, when we're being told to maintain our distance and stand apart, that the Lord is laying upon the heart of so many believers to be the light, to be the church, to prefer others above ourselves, to be good neighbors. I've spoken with others, Ronnie and Paul and some of the others, that they have got this overwhelming urge to to draw near, to reach out to those that are around us that are hurting. There are so many people out there. There's, There's so many dark storm clouds on the horizon. And there are so many people out there that are unsure, that are being tossed about on these waves of this turbulent sea that they're in. And we're called to be the light. We're called to be the voice of calm in the storm. Jesus calmed the storm with a word. We're the ones that are supposed to bring them to shore, show them the way, be the light. We're called to be the church. You sitting there right now watching me, or watching this later, you're the church. Not this wonderful facility that I'm standing in that is almost vacant. We've been blessed with a beautiful building and it's served many of purposes. But this is not the church. This is a building that we have for, for use. You are the church. My wife and I have been attending New Life Fellowship for a good number of years, and we have heard when people have come here, and there have been many a prophetic word spoken over this body and the body of Christ in this town about how we are going to be an oasis. Well, guess what? Right where you are, right now, at this very moment, you're an oasis. You are the church. I am the church. We lament about all these things that we cannot do right now. We can't come together in fellowship like we want to. We can't go and gather in big corporate worship services like we want to. There's so many things that we can't do that we've kind of lost focus of the things that we're called to do. We're called to be neighbors. We're called to be the light, the church in our communities, in our homes. Some of us are sitting in our homes right now and we're not even neighborly with the people in the next room. Your church is right there, right now. My church is every Sunday morning in my living room. We gather together and, you know, we may be in, some of us may be in our PJs, but we're there and we're worshiping and we're having church. And we're talking about the Lord and we're raising Him up. And when I go to work and I talk to people that are, you know, hurting and struggling and just confused and mad about the things that are going on, I don't add to that. I just try to be a voice of reason. I try to be a neighbor. We're called to be the church. We're called to be light. (laughs) We're called to be neighbors. Well, yeah, but Greg, you don't understand. You know, it's just me and my house. That's okay. Some of you guys are doing it right now, watching this on Facebook Live, and you've invited maybe one or two people that you have daily contact with, and you're sitting there, and you're watching it. I've drove by the park, one of the parks close to where I live, and I see every every Sunday morning, there's a group of about eight people, and they're sitting out there in these lawn chairs, and they're all socially distanced, and they're wearing their masks, but they got their Bibles open, and they're sharing the Word of God, and they're raising their hands in worship. We're called to be the church. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. I'm standing in the sanctuary this morning, and there's about eight of us in here, nine of us in here. Guess what? There's ten. Just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, three went in, but when you looked in, there was a fourth. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. You're sitting in your home right now, and you've got people gathered around you. Guess what? You're the church. There are people you deal with every day. Maybe you're still working, and if you are, blessed. And if you're working and you're dealing with people, guess what? That's your church. 
Be a neighbor. Be a neighbor. We're being called to prefer others over ourselves. So what's that look like? Well, I kind of made a, a comment about that earlier, about the fact that, you know, where I work at and, and some of the people I interact with, they don't have the same beliefs that I do. They don't have the same opinions about things in this world that I do. And that's okay. Rather than voice my own opinion or voice my own preference, I just try to be an ear. I try to listen. I try to understand. Because I'm looking for an opportunity to provide them with something they need in the name of the one that they need. I remember when I first started in ministry a long time ago, <laughs> We went to a, a pastor's school in Phoenix, Arizona. And they had a bunch of different, like, training seminars and things like that. And one of them was regarding outreach ministry for homeless people. And it's not one of those where you go and sit down and you watch a bunch of PowerPoint slides and, you, you know, you listen to somebody lecture. No, no, you're going to load up on a bus and we're going to go minister because that's action. And so I remember we're out there, and, and we get to a spot where these people had been before, the, the, people, the ministry leaders. And they set up, and, you know, these people that know them are starting to show up. And we're serving them, uh, I think it was chili dogs and, and bottled water and, you know, having a great time. And I remember this lady come up, and I handed her a, a chili dog and, and a bottle of water. She said, I haven't seen you here before. I said, no, no, was, you know, I'm just passing through. And I said, well, she goes, I'm going to tell you. People don't care so much about what you say as uh, what you do. And she just walks away. And I was blown away. I was, I was broken. I'm like, yeah. I got, you know, in, in a 15-second interaction with handing somebody something that they needed. Right? She needed some food. She needed some water. And I got a lesson in what, it, what ministry looks like, what it really is, what really matters. If you can give somebody something they need in the name of the one that they need, we got to prefer others above ourselves. There are times when I hear conversations and I want to jump right in there because I have strong opinions. And those who know me and know me well know I love a good debate. I'm, uh, I'm a little more confrontational than I should be in some things. So I love it. So for me, I have to curb my, my natural personality because I need to prefer others above myself because what would that serve? Yeah, I could jump in there and I could, you know, but there comes a time where you have to prefer others above yourself. Not to the, not to the point where you're, you know, suffering for your, own, for your own faith. Nothing like that. But sometimes just listening to what people say and looking for opportunities to find, hey, you know what, I can help you with that. I've had more people that if I've had conversations with in these last five, six months than I have had previously just because I'm simply willing to listen and and I know, I know that even in all this turmoil and all this craziness and everything that's going on, I know that Jesus never changes. I know that God is still on the throne. I know that regardless of what these worldly circumstances are, eternity awaits me. So I know this. And I have the ability now to listen to what these people are saying and maybe, just maybe, interject a voice of reason, or maybe some calm, or maybe just be an ear to listen. In short, being a neighbor. As I was watching this, this movie and, and I was researching some things about Mr. Rogers and, and coming to realize just how far-reaching his life was, I won't even just say ministry. His life, his life was his ministry. And it was far-reaching. It had such a large impact. And I remember reading through some of the things that I was reading about him, and I, and I stopped. Because, again, I asked, I'm that guy. I asked God all the, you know, the silly questions. And I said, God, I had tears in my eyes. I said, God, why can't you give us a few more like him? And because I'm that guy and I ask God those questions, God is God and answers them. And God said, won't you be a neighbor? 
See, here's the thing with me, and I'm sure with others, we're always looking at somebody who's doing something phenomenal for God and for the kingdom, and we think, man, there needs to be more like him. And what we don't realize is God's sitting there going, hey, you can be like him. You can be like her. So I'm going to leave you guys with this this morning. Will you be a neighbor? Will you love your neighbors as you love yourself? Will you be the one that reaches out to that person that you see that regardless of their circumstances, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of whatever it is that's keeping you from reaching out to them, will you be that neighbor that reaches out to them and loves them as you love yourself? Before I close, I want to have an opportunity for those of you who maybe you don't know this love of God that I'm speaking about. I want to take an opportunity right now, wherever you are, whether you're watching this right now live or you're watching this six months from now on a rerun on a YouTube video, I want you to take a moment and I want you to reflect on the fact that God loves you. So wherever you are right now, if you're not, as long as you're not driving, please don't close your eyes while you're driving. If you can pull over safely and do that, then, then do so. I'm going to ask you that if you can safely do so, I want you to take a moment, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to ask Jesus into your heart. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and we're going to, we're going to have a song. So if you're there and, you're, and you've got your eyes closed right now, all you need to say is just simply, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I need you in my heart. I want to live for you. I want to know this love of God that I heard about today. And I come to you and I lay down my sin, I confess it to you, and I ask you to wash me clean and to raise me up a new creation in Christ Jesus. I pray this today in Jesus' name. If you've prayed that this morning, please get a hold of somebody here at New Life on the, on the web address or somebody, if you're sitting with somebody who is a believer, talk to them. One other thing that I want to address before we wrap. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for some time. Maybe you've been saved. Maybe you know God. Maybe you've forgotten or you never fully accepted the love of God. Maybe you've never got to that point in yourself and in your walk where you, you completely understand the overwhelming love of God. I want to pray with you right now. Father God, I lift those up right now, Lord, that have known you. We've walked with you. We've heard your voice. We've felt your hand on our shoulders. Lord, we know you. And to some extent, we know that you love us. But I pray right now, Father God, that you would overwhelm us with this love. You would bring us to our knees with the weight of the love that you have for us, Father God. That it would be undeniable, Lord. That no matter what we face from this moment on, we will never, ever doubt that you love us ever again, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you would bring us to a point where we've examined our hearts And we are fully committed to letting you have your way in our hearts, Lord God, so that we can learn to love our neighbors as ourselves because we've accepted the love that you have for us. Lord, where there's been areas of unforgiveness, where there's been areas of bitterness and anger and hostility and whatever that mess is, I pray right now, Lord God, that that would be broken, that that would be turned over to you, that that would be completely taken by your love.
Lord, your love is never ending, never failing, and always faithful. And we thank you for that, Lord. We're going to have one more worship song, and then we're going to close in prayer. Yes, Lord. It's always the most important part of the service to me. Young man, I was a young man. You don't know the day, the hour, but the day and the hour is coming, so it's best to be ready. So if you didn't pull your car over, pull it over now. You're not promised nothing except that you will stand before a righteous and just God.
Father God, this morning we just lift you up, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your never-ending love. Lord, we worship you. We lift up your name, Lord. We just simply say we love you, Lord. Show us how to be better neighbors, Father God. Show us how to love others as you've loved us. In Jesus' name. Church, God loves you. I love you. If I haven't seen you, I miss you. And uh, take care.